Hello, everybody, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 12th. Today is our April featured teacher show with Donna Roman. I'm Lori Moffat, one of the hosts of the show, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you so much, Tammy, for doing the closed captioning for the show. This link at the bottom of this particular slide goes to today's live binder. And Peggy will be posting that link into chat. Remember, for the live binders for Classroom 2.0 Live, the tabs are on the left column rather than across the top. So these are all resources that um, Donna will be featuring today. All the recordings are posted on the Archives and Resources page. And that lives at this link, live.classroom2.com slash archive dash and dash resources dot html. There are various forms of recordings that you can get access to on the Archives and Resources page. Here's where you get to do some participation in the show. We'd like to ask where in the world you're logging in from. I'm from the middle of Pennsylvania. I know Peggy's logging in from Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's logging in from Southwest Arkansas. I'm not sure where Donna's logging in from. Tony will be introducing Donna shortly. And we tend to have an international crowd. We do have somebody logging in from Italy. And you can also, as you see, type in the chat. Don is from Illinois. Thanks, Tony. All right, the first polling question is this one. Do you use PBL or project-based learning in your classroom? And remember, remember you vote with the uh, check in the box underneath your bold name right underneath the participant's title for the participant's pod. And once a number of people have voted, then I will post the results to the whiteboard. This does not work for the voting. You've got to vote with the tool in the participants window. All right, I'll post these now. And from those people that voted, 55% have used project-based learning in the classroom. Our next question is, have you participated in global projects with your students? It's either yes or no. Then I'll wait for people to vote. And then post those to the whiteboard. And we're split. 33% have, 33% have not, and 33% didn't vote for that one. Our third polling question is, are you involved with an online global organization? And Peggy typed in the Global Education Conference counts for this. Okay, and I will post the replies. 42% voted yes for this, 23% did not, and we had a number who didn't, who didn't vote. 
Again, welcome everybody to our April featured teacher show. I will now turn the mic over to Tony who will introduce our guest today. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I have known Donna for quite a few years and I have done lots of different um, collaboration pieces with her. Donna is a fifth grade teacher at Mill Creek School in Illinois. She's a blogger, trainer, and presenter committed to providing rich learning opportunities for her learners and professional network. She is a recent recipient of ISTE's first place Siegel Online Award in 2013 and a Microsoft Innovative Expert Educator and she just got a fun trip to Spain with that. Donna is active in professional development online and in her district in the consortium of school networks ISTE and in iEARN. So Donna um, for me is an inspiration because when we started uh, she's at a school district that wasn't very open to a lot of the things that we're doing now and she really fought for her school and for her district to really open up the doors and become a flat classroom um, for her students, which is great. And Donna also helps a lot of us by organizing a monthly meeting that a bunch of us meet and just talk about great ideas. And uh, we all kind of spear up different ideas during that conversation. So it's just a wonderful pleasure to introduce Donna. And our next question is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So Donna's going to be asking this, or answering this. Sorry. Thanks, Donnie. Thank you very much. And we've had, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about our PLN group, which meets tomorrow, by the way. So thanks for introducing that and me. And Web 2.0, gosh, where do you even start? Uh, to me, that means opening everything for teachers, for classrooms, for kids. If getting beyond um, our normal conversations with our team members and opening our students and ourselves up to um, the rest of the world and all the different ideas people have and the different ways that we can collaborate online. So um, I'm sure that term will change over the years, you know, Web 2.0, but to me that means interactive. Okay, I guess I just want to first start out with just pausing. I think we are in such a hurry all the time. We're so busy rushing here and there and going to this meeting and that meeting. And I know a lot of people um, will listen to the recording later because they can't be here now and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's important that we stop and look that we weren't doing this a few years ago. We weren't online learning from each other. We weren't collaborating together. And there's still a lot of people that haven't had that opportunity yet. But by that, we are really, truly changing the world of education and changing student involvement, and which affects everything as teachers. So I think it's really important to stop and really look at the power that we have by meeting together and working together. And Lucy Gray, many of us um, have, are familiar with Lucy, have met her or seen her online. She coined a term, professional ge generosity, and she uses it a lot. And I think that our industry has more professional generosity than anywhere I've seen. It's just incredible the amount of things you can learn and share with other people. So in that vein, I always, you know, my fifth grade kids, they always talk about when they're, when they're an adult or when they're in college. And I always tell them, you don't just wake up one day and you're an adult. You, you turn into adult every single day, every drop you, you put into your life with your intentions, your thoughts, your actions, your reactions, that's what creates you as an adult. And I think our organizations are exactly that same way. We don't just wake up all of a sudden and our entire educational system is the way it is. It happens little by little with everything that's going on. And, you know, we used to pretty much be out of that loop. You know, we kind of, and we, we are so, to some degrees, you know, we are, you know, we wait for whatever law is going to get passed and how it's going to affect us. And we can sit and look at that as victims and, oh, here now here's another thing. I don't know how many millions of times I've heard that from people. But we do have power in that, and we are exercising that right now. So I often see our organizations being um, driven by fear and all this testing and we're falling behind and, and all this stuff going on. And by organizations that are trying to get personal gain out of, out of the education system and that sort of thing, but then I also look at what we're doing and all the opportunities that we have through our direct experience, through our passion, and 
self-direction and showing up like we're doing right now and speaking up and really as educators looking at what's working, collaborating with each other, taking our own time, here we are on a Saturday, um, learning something new, working together, and I think that is incredibly powerful. And not only is it powerful, I, I hear this frequently that teachers are like, well, I want my kids to learn how to collaborate. Oh, they just don't communicate very well. Or you hear it from the district administrators. Well, we need the teachers to collaborate more. We need the, you know, teachers have to have more drive and more passion. Well, you really can't give what you don't own. And you can't start somewhere and then look down and expect someone to to do that if you aren't doing it yourself, if the organization isn't reflecting it. And in our case, if you're a classroom teacher, if we aren't doing that, we can't give that to our learners. And we're, we're great examples of that because we're doing that right now. We're collaborating. We're communicating. We're learning a new tech tool. We're using all these things and taking risks, figuring out something new. And if we aren't willing to do that ourselves, it is almost impossible to give that to your students. So some things never change. I mean, I've been in education for a long time, and many of you have too, and there's always too much to do. There's always something new. There's always something frustrating. But another thing that never changes is you have to really think about the important things and put those in first and learning how to work smarter. And I think educators are really learning how to work smarter, and that's kind of a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today. But we get distracted a lot of times by the outside factors like teacher evaluation or um, student assessment or, you know, this where the park testing is coming up for us. And we get so distracted and so focused on that that it fills all of our administrative time or our, our, um, our team meeting time and instead of looking at what is important. Because I think if we look at what's important first, all that other stuff will fit in and make a lot more sense. So one way to do that, this is just like a basic thing, is one way to do that to expand your container is to collaborate with other people, just like we're doing right now. It expands your container. You only know what you know. So if you're working just with your teammates in, my, like say, my fifth grade team, we only know what we know and we're hashing around the ideas we already know. If you're working within your building or your district, the same thing, unless you're willing to go out and collaborate and learn something new. And a great way to do that is to embed that in what you're already doing right now, not adding another thing, making conscious choices about how you um, spend your time. And these are things teachers do, all educators do all the time. We're always planning, communicating, you know, we've, we use email, we're all these things. So instead of using regular tools that we're used to, like email or our, plan, our planner on, you know, paper and pencil or however we do it, there are collaborative tools for all of that. And if you're using a collaborative tool, it's just one click away. If you're on LiveBinders and you're organizing your materials on there, it's one click away to find somebody else who shared their information. And now you have 10 times more capacity for information. And all of these sites, I'm not going to talk much about them. I know they've been talked about a lot on this show. Um, but they are all excellent tools to embed collaboration into what you're doing. And the same goes for your students. We want them to be collaborative, and we want to embed what we're already doing in our classroom and allow them to develop a professional learning network and to be more collaborative with students. We're already writing. Might as well be writing and blogging so that they have authentic audience or using um, a tool like OneDrive or Google Drive that is collaborative in nature. We're already communicating, so let's communicate outside of our classroom. We're already organizing things, so let's find ways that the kids can also develop those same things. And as Tony said, I was just recently last month in Barcelona, Spain, which was great with Microsoft. And there was a, key, uh, um, a teacher from Belgium that spoke um, during the ending session. And she said, technology is nothing without pedagogy. And together, they can make magic. And that is so true. We are so focused right now on putting more tech in schools. And I, it, just, it makes me cringe sometimes because I look at the amount of money that we're spending and all of us know, anybody in the classroom knows that having technology in the classroom is meaningless unless teachers know how to teach with it. That has to come first before we keep pouring more and more technology into our classrooms. 
how do you teach with it? It's just like any other thing. If we're getting a new um, way to teach reading, for instance, a lot of us have been through several iterations of that. We teach teachers how to teach reading. We model it. We demonstrate it. We show them how to do it. We just don't throw the things in there and expect them to do it. And technology is just the same thing. So if you look at technology, is we all know how to take the content of what we have to teach. And we know how to turn that into knowledge. We know how to teach kids how to understand that stuff or to know it. But technology, if you use pe the pedagogy this way, can actually take that knowledge and turn it into skill. And that's what we're going to be talking about today through two different things, project-based learning and 21st century learning, because that is what takes just that information and turns it into actual skill that is usable. So I was in Spain with uh, Microsoft, as I said, and one of the things that there, we were working with, with there were um, 250 teachers from, I think, 89 countries around the world. It was an amazing opportunity. And we were working specifically on 21st century learning. They have an excellent um, set of rubrics for students They're, and for teachers. They're incredible. They're really easy for you to look as a teacher to see if you've been actually embedded these in. You, and you also can use those to look if for the students so they can see if they're doing these things. And I um, have a link in the, in the live binder, and I really think um, it's worth checking out. The other aspect is project-based learning. We're trying to really, um, in the United States anyway, work with the Common Core State Standards and embed um, skill in real life things into our, into our teaching. And project-based learning to me is the best way to do that. There are a number of different ways, but really this is the way, the way that I've really found is meaningful to the kids. It incorporates all of these things, and it really is the marriage between content and skill. Between project-based learning and um, those 21st century skills, that really um, brings those two things together. And as far as project-based learning, there's one excellent um, organization that always comes to mind. I've been working with the, the resources on the BIE website for years. They've, they've actually been around since 1987, so that's almost 30 years. Pro project-based learning is not a new concept. It's been around for decades. And they have developed some great resources that are free on their site. They also have a number of books. They have a lot of um, webinars that they run, and they have Google Hangouts. They're just a very, if you're, if you're interested in project-based learning, that's, that's your place to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some examples. And first, of course, when you design any project, you design it with the curricular areas first and your assessments and what, what, your, what your country's guidelines are for standards. And then we're going to look at tech tools. But I really want to, if you, if you could pay attention, particularly how we're using those tech tools. Because I think we have a lot of times we just throw a lot of technology in there to look flashy and whatever. But each tech tool that you use should have a specific reason. And mine always tie to those 21st century um, learning skills. And you'll see over and over I have a core set of tools that I use for some of these things. And it's not because I don't want to try new things. I actually try a lot of new things. And I um, do a lot of beta testing for different um, software and that sort of thing. But I really, really value collaboration with other classes. And I really value collaboration with um, classes around the world. And in order to do that, you don't want the tech to be so overwhelming for the group that people get too stressed out with it. So if you can stick with a couple tools that everybody's familiar with, or they're easy to figure out, and you can help each other out, I found that the collaborative part is a lot easier. So that's one of the reasons I use a lot of the same tools. Let me start with this one, because this is the one I did for Microsoft. But I want to just start by um, telling you a little story. I was looking at um, an application somebody sent, actually I got it from two different people, saying, hey, this looks like something you might be interested in, this Microsoft um, Innovative Expert Educator thing. So I opened the thing and was going to fill up the application, and it was pretty lengthy. They're very rigorous, which I didn't know at the time. And then they said, submit a project that you're doing. So I just happened to be finished with this particular project that I was doing with Moral Keith in Ireland. And I didn't really give much thought to it. Well, this project was actually chosen, my, along with my application, um, 
just, I think it was just 20 some teachers from the entire United States were picked. So, and they're very rigorous. And all, the reason I'm saying this is because working with my PLN, working with BIE, and then working just intuitively in the classroom, this pro I designed this project and it actually was a good project. It was great in all those areas. So that's just to say you can really learn a ton by working online without, um, I, don't, I think I'm the only one in my district that does or was doing project-based learning. I know there's a few now. And there's some, um, you know, so I was working alone on this at the time with my PLN online. So as I talk about um, tools, if you look at connection tools, communication tools, collaborate tools, um, and authentic audience, that's really important to me to have an authentic audience. And instead of me explaining this project, I actually had to do a little video for Microsoft. So, and it's three minutes long, and I think um, Peggy said she put that in the chat. So if everybody could just listen to this video, that'll be a quick way to do it. And you can't click on it from this slide. You have to go through the link. And then maybe put a little check above your name um, when you're done so that we know you're finished. Okay, well, it looks like a lot of people are done. Finished. And I see a lot of people joining us. Just making sure that you know that we are here. It's silent on here, but it looks like we're not here. So this project, just to show you that I had absolutely no, cri no idea what the criteria was when I submitted it, and it actually it had all the, all the 21st century skills built in because that's what they were looking for, which was great, and it was a lot of fun, and there's nothing more boring than learning about some dead guy when you're, when you're 10 years old. So it turned out to be a great project. It was a lot of fun. The next project I want to talk about is a project that Lisa Parisi and I did um, last year. And it was actually designed by Lisa Parisi. And we won this award for it, which was an amazing opportunity. But it was, we both teach fifth grade. And we both have geography as one of our um, core social studies. Um, area, content areas. So Lisa decided that we could um, use natural disasters to study geography because the kids, if the kids had to learn about tornadoes and tsunamis and hurricanes and all these sandstorms, they'd have to know about geography and they'd have to know about all the relationship between um, weather patterns and it was really, it was an excellent idea. So we started off our project and Almost right away, there was an earthquake in Costa Rica. So we found someone from Costa Rica to Skype into both of our classrooms and talk to us about it, which was great. We are, we're always looking for opportunities as we, as we go on all of these projects. But then not long after that, there was the hurricane in, um, on the East Coast last year, which was amazingly incredible. And Lisa's school is located on Long Island. So her school was shut down, you know, they, that Long Island was a, a really big mess. And the kids were, um, we didn't know what happened to them. My kids were all worried. There was this stuff all over the news. We kind of saw it coming, but we weren't sure what was going to happen. So what her kids did is they decided to have a podcast and um, they, they got each student online uh, through the phone and made a little recording checking in saying, hi, Sue, can you tell us how you are and how, you know, is your house okay and everything. So each kid reported in and they posted it on the wiki so we could all see that they were okay. And so that went on and off. We were watching this and the kids really in my classroom realized that there was such a need for all kinds of stuff in that area. It was, it was incredible. And that, that really moved them to act. So I said, well, there's a lot of things that, could, that we could do. And some kids wanted to collect dog food and some wanted to collect blankets and this and that. And I said, how about if you all go research um, different organizations, come up with one you, wa you want, um, you think we should support, and then write about it, which in um, teacher speak is called argument writing. So they did just that. They went out and they made a really good pitch for the organization they thought was the best for us to support. And then they each put it, posted on their blog and got comments from their partner schools all over the world and um, suggestions from them. And then they got up in front of the class and they each presented their idea and their argument and um, had a class vote after that. And I had nothing to do with it. I was sitting in the back room the whole time. It was amazing. They decided on the American Red Cross because they thought that covered most of the bases. 
So in between the time um, this happened and now they've written several different things. They've been reading all kinds of things on their own. They can't get enough of this information. They've decided on a game plan and then they wanted to um, raise money by asking the school to put it in their newsletter. And I said, you know what, why don't you come up with a way that you can do it all on your own? We don't have to have your parents sending in money and the secretary putting it in the newsletter. How can you do it? So first they came up with these elaborate ideas about um, spaghetti dinners and all the stuff that um, would involve a lot of adults. So again, I encouraged them to do something on their own and they decided they were going to do a fundraiser um, in the neighborhood and they weren't going to divide into their friend groups as I expected. They were going to divide into block groups. So every kid had a block that they worked with and they were incredible. They went out, they made plans, they had um, dates and times and parents were involved with um, knowing where the kids were. And then um, some kids went and developed those online sites for people to um, donate to and were hitting people up for that. And then um, I can't remember which holiday. A holiday came and the kids decided they're going to extend their fundraising so that they could um, hit up their, uh, in their um, relatives during the, the holiday. And they ended up raising almost $5,000. And I, have, I had 24 kids in my class. It was incredible. It was very powerful for them to know they can act. They did it on their own. I did not get involved at all. The parents didn't get involved except for supervising when they were doing the fundraising. It was an incredible experience. And they did so much writing in between that. So then the schools got back together. You know, um, everything was fine. The school came back in Long Island. We got back to our project. And the students learned about their, their um, natural disasters. They took that information and they went into Google Docs and worked with their team collaboratively and actually wrote their projects together. Some was synchronously and some was asynchronously. We'd have the Skype going um, on my computer and kids would call their small groups. They'd say, we need to talk to the Sandstorm group. And they would have little small discussion groups either in the chat on Google Docs or in front of the camera on Skype. And we ended up, as a final project, um, doing newscasts. So one school would be where the um, news studio is. Those were the reporters in the studio. And then they'd pass it off to the kids that were out in the field. And so we'd have kids with a sandstorm background, and they would be reporting from the disaster there. So they collaboratively worked on the writing, every single point of, part of it. And then they also worked collaboratively on the videos. And that was just incredible. And then at the end, each kid got to pick um, what tool they wanted to use to do their final project. So then they also did an individual project. So right now, I'm actually wrapping up this great project. And um, I started with IRON, an IRON project. I'll talk a little bit about the, that organization later on. But it is, um, we started off with a research project. IRON has a project called My Hero. So we were paired up with students around the world, mostly from Eastern Europe. I, I can't remember right now which countries, but we researched a hero, and then we wrote about we wrote an essay, kind of a formal informational essay, and then we posted them all together. So that was the collaborative part with that. But then we really got to thinking about how everybody has got real hero qualities, and each student does, and how do we find those in kids? So we joined with a bunch of classrooms, and most of them are in my district, which was great. That was my first opportunity to work so closely with other classrooms in my own district. And we worked through Skype and the same tools at Moto, and um, we had heroes come in from all different walks of life. We had college students and social workers and musicians and all different kinds of people come in and talk to the students about their hero qualities and how it's every day. It's just everyday heroes. And Every time um, a guest came in, the students would reflect on that and blog. And then they would get responses from all of their um, partner classrooms. It um, ended up being really multidisciplinary because each speaker, some, uh, there was a man that was a physicist, and there was all, I just, all kinds of different people. So each time that came up, kids were interested in learning about that particular field. So, and it's still going on. but. It has been a, an amazing thing. And on that website, I also have all the teacher planning um, documents on there, too, if anyone wants to recreate that. Another one we're working on right now, and it's the second year for that, is one with Aaron Maurer. He actually designed this. It's called Eagle Eye to the World, and it's focused on 
um, a webcam in Iowa with a pair of birds and our baby just hatched. We had one chick and it hatched um, April 1st. I, as I said, geography, um, ecosystems is a big part of my um, curriculum and everything always has reading and writing in it. We are using Edmodo. We're watching this um, this baby now getting fed and all and kids are doing research on the habitat lifespan of the eagle, the cultural symbolism around the world of the eagle, protection laws. So there's different areas that students are working with groups on to collaborate and report and we're going to be using VoiceThread for our final creation tool. This is one that um, I actually designed with a principal that I, an old principal of mine several years ago called Reading Across the Globe. We were looking at um, the nature of prejudice, if I'm not mistaken. We were looking at how um, prejudice is formed. And it really is a lot of times from differences and making judgments about differences. Like people have a different religion, therefore it's the next part that makes the, the prejudice. So we thought it would be kind of cool to have kids all reading a shared book from all over the world and talking about the differences, talking about the similarities, and really looking at why those differences exist. And a lot of times those differences exist because of geography, where you are in the world. Like sometimes um, it's the food or the, your transportation or the way your houses look. It's because your environment. So we have actually taken this, and I think I've done this three or four years now, and it's kind of changed over the years, but the main theme is always the same. What are the same and what is different? Again, we used Poplet. We do, um, I'm working with a school right now in Taiwan, and they are very limited in English, so we're translating between Chinese and English and, and using Poplet and pictures, and that's been a great ongoing project. Here's another one that I um, loved when we uh, did this one last year, and we've done it this year as well. Part of my math curriculum at the time was um, using data in graphing and charting. And that's such a stale, dry thing. And you try to make it fun with kids polling each other in the classroom. But I thought this would be really a cool tie-in with geography. Having classes from around the world, and I handpicked eight schools so that they would be all over the map geography. I couldn't find anybody in the southern part of Africa or South America, but I found everybody else. And we graphed temperature, sunlight, um, and then we tried to graph or find out where you were if that had to do with the hemisphere or not. So the kids were learning about why our partner school in Alaska had way longer days at some point and way shorter days at some point and how that affected the animals and the plants and the landforms. And then we had a Central American school and then we looked at the difference of where they were in the geography and their plants and that sort of thing. So that was really a, a fun project. And this is um, a project that I just finished right now with actually Lucy Gray was the consultant for it. She was working with a Falconer school in Chicago Public Schools and she asked me if I would be a partner school and I would I said of course because I'm always loving that kind of thing. And it's something that everybody's used to, it's literature circles. We do it in our classroom all the time. And she, um, they had picked this book, which works perfect with fifth grade um, Common Core State Standards. It couldn't have been better. And what we did is we took the old-fashioned idea of literature circles, and we embedded our 21st century learning skills with the teachers and with the students. So we were collaborating and lesson planning using Edmodo and using Google Docs. And that's reaching out outside of our schools as we were teaching our students to do that as well. So that was a really good bridging activity. So the thing is, you do not have to create your own. So some of you are, I know a lot of you said you had never done project-based learning before. You don't have to create your own project. That is, I mean, as Tony said, her and I have been working together for a long time. And so little by little, I've gotten to this point where I really want to develop my own. But you don't have to do that. So there are some great things you can do. There, you know, if you're just starting off in this, you don't have to jump in over your head. This is such an excellent thing to start with, the global read aloud. Um, Pernell Rip is an amazing woman and teacher, and she started this a few years ago, and it has taken off like wildfire. We're all reading aloud to our students, so we might as well read aloud together and have, and have discussions in Edmodo. It's one of those tools that's kind of just all over the place, and once you learn how to use it, you can use it all over. And the books are already out for this year. The titles, I can't remember off, off the top of my head, but 
They're always excellent uh, titles. The t you meet some amazing teachers there, and you can make a point of staying in contact, and that can be your first collaborative partners if you don't have any. Yet. Another excellent organization, this is the Global Classroom Project, and um, it's headed by Michael Graffin in Australia. So it's not a, um, a lot of the, the countries that are participating are in other parts. A lot of times they're real US heavy, but this is an amazing group of educators. And if you look at the list of teachers involved there, you'll find some of the best global educators on the planet are using these projects. These projects are designed by, by teachers, and they're run by just regular teachers. And they're all the way from kindergarten through there's, a, there's even a few high school projects. There's great things there. Everything's free. Um, and as far as these organizations, you get out of it as much as you put in. If you want to embed collaboration and communication and that sort of thing in, then you need to make that effort to do that in your classroom as well. At the beginning, you're just kind of learning the tools, and you kind of have to allow that learning curve for yourself. But as you get going, you'll be more and more skilled at embedding the standards that you need to embed in your classroom. OK, here's one that not many people know about. And I love this organization, Wilderness Classroom. They are originally Chicago-based public school teachers. And they decided that they wanted to go out and create a classroom outside. And so they did. They, I think it was two men to start off with. The man on the right was one of them. And um, I actually met them. They came to Mill Creek School in our, in our um, town and visited with the kids and gave them an in-service because they were local. They still do that, by the way. I think that's a fundraiser because these are all free projects that they do. And they go out. And so for instance, if you, if you want to jump in in May, they're going to, I think, the Amazon. and they kayak and they canoe and they, they were dog sledding this winter. And they are true teachers. They have, their site has lesson plans and suggestions and interactive things for the kids to do. It is really a great resource. And again, um, geography, ecosystems, that sort of thing is a big part of my curriculum. And these teachers are excellent. Actually, these two ended up getting married over the years. So um, check that out. That's really a great organization. And I talked about iron a little bit before, and I'm going to um, throw it in here now. It is the oldest running and the biggest collaborative organization for education, I think, on the planet. And they've been around since um, pen pal, pen and paper. They've been around, I think, 30 years, 20, 20 years maybe. But um, this is the only one that is a fee-based one that I'm going to talk about. They um, charge for, for school. And I, I don't, it's not that much. I, can't, I don't know offhand how much it is, but it's not much. But their projects are amazing. They have a, a place that you can go in and enter your grade level, enter your subject matter, enter your language, and it will pop up with all the different um, things that they have, um, projects that you can get involved in. They are also run by teachers. So you, again, start with your curriculum, start with what you teach first, and then you find the project to fit it. And um, there's a, there's a wealth of information. And I just want to talk about this little project. This is through Iron. Several years ago, I was trying to find a way to get more teachers in my um, building involved and more students, because it was really just my classroom. So I have this after school program to do holiday card projects, which is part of Iron. And you can do it as a classroom as well. So I've got a bunch of kids together. And what it is is they pair you up with, I don't know, five or six schools. You make holiday cards around December, and then you send them to each other, like by snail mail. And then you open them up, and you take pictures, which is very straightforward. It's a very easy project, but it was amazing. We um, shared pictures of what we ate for lunch that day. We um, shared stories and little performances that we did, um, our music performances during the holidays. And I met some amazing teachers. The woman on the right, or in the middle, is Ruth Hu in Taiwan. And since this project, we have worked together probably three times every year since then. And we um, met on Skype. We actually do every year meet on Skype. And we, um, I've really maintained some of these, some of these schools are not very active online, but I make a point of trying to stay in contact with these people. I also went to go visit our Sylvanian school with some other teachers from my building a couple years ago which was an amazing opportunity to go see what their school was like, too. So all you have to do is just jump in with the project and um, make the connection. 
And as Tony was talking about, we have a group that meets once a month, and our meeting is tomorrow. And it is teachers from all over the world. And all it took was just one email to say, hey, I sent out an email, I don't know, a year ago and said, what about getting together periodically and just talking about curriculum and, you know, just get having, you know, just see how it goes. So we got together and we have been meeting once a month religiously ever since. And we talk about curriculum, we talk about tech tools, we talk about um, classroom management, we talk about standards across the world. It is an amazing group of people. And a lot of people say, well, can I join that group? Well, the discussions really can't happen when you have too many. I think there's close to 20 people. Luckily, not all of us show it up every time. But we have a wiki that we have public. So you can see, and we are all mentor teachers. We love people to jump in and, and on anything that we put on there. We have um, a lot of different product, projects that we do. And we also want to use this as a model for you. So other people can say, hey, this is a good idea. Why don't you pull a couple people together? I mean, it would be great to see these meetings going on all over the world because it, this is probably one of the most powerful things I do every month is meet with these teachers and discuss whatever comes up. So as far as technology goes, this is something that's all over the place. Everyone's talking about technology, and technology is not some kind of like magic thing. We really have to look at how we're using technology. We, most of us sitting in this room right now, have come from a consumer, you know, era of technology where we're used to getting things from it, and that's what we're, that's what we, and if we're not trained as teachers, that's what we have the students do: go Google it or go practice your flashcards on it, or go do this mass um, reinforcement game or whatever. And those are good things to use the computer for, but they are, you don't certainly need one-on-one -on -one computers to do that in a classroom. That this, to have one-on-one -on -one computers, a teacher has to learn how to teach that way. And so as you go up, you're, you're looking at this chart, and you get to the top, and it's actually using tech tools to create, to synthesize the information you have, like to knowledge construction, you've constructed knowledge, you've come out with something new, and now you're going to create a product with it. And there's a lot of steps to that, and that does not just happen because kids know how to use tech. Kids do not know how to use tech this way. This is a teaching, these are teaching strategies. So tech tool decisions actually come last in your planning. You start with your learning objectives, um, and you look at the 21st century learning skills and you try to look at what areas can you embed collaboration, where can you embed communication, where can you do these things, and then when you find that in your lesson, then you look for the tech tool. You don't go learn tech tools and then try to fit them in somehow. And I think this is probably the biggest switch that we're seeing right now in technology and it's a long time coming. So I'm going to refer back to this. This is kind of the thing that I was showing you from Microsoft. They have these rubrics, this is like a little cheat sheet one, they're much more extensive. But this, they, they kind of show you um, if you're doing this in your classroom and what it would look like. So for instance, technology, you start with the standards and the top one says, are you using tech tools? Can the kids use them? Well, yes, fine. That's what we pretty much stop there. But then are they using that to build knowledge, for knowledge construction? Or, or are they just memorizing things or just repeating what they've read? Are they actually using it to construct knowledge? And is that tool required for that? And then in the end, can they use tech to then design their own product with tech? So there are many stages of it. And we just see a lot of schools stopping at that first one. And um, again, you don't need one-to-one -one devices for that. So you know, professional development has always been my love. I used to be a social worker, and I was always involved in training. It's kind of my one thread that's gone throughout. And I, it, I'm looking at the difference of training tech now as when, we, when I first started teaching. Technology, when I first started teaching, was like a separate thing, a department that kind of functioned on its own. That is totally not the case anymore. It is treated like pedagogy. It is a teaching strategy. It, and you use it just as you were teaching a teaching strategy um, in reading or anything else. People are not just na naturally going to get it. It has to start with conversations about what you're teaching, um, what, you, what your um, plan is, how can you embed more 21st century learning. Those conversations start before you even start talking about tech. 
And then I really like the 70% rule of thumb. And I'm going to go back to Lucy Gray's um, literature circle thing that I, um, that project I talked to you about. If teachers are not familiar with tech, start with 70%. People know how to do literature circles. They know how to um, write lesson plans for that. They know how to assess it. They know how to group kids. They already know 70%. So let's just take that 30% and embed some um, strategies that they aren't familiar with so that it's not total overwhelm. And as you go, that 70% gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It expands the container and that you can get more varied in your um, strategies both with teaching and with technology. And then when, when instead of having these wholesale or these gigantic scale um, tech trainings like Let's learn how to use Excel and then figure out how to do it, use it in your classroom. Those days are kind of gone unless they're on a tool that is really widespread, like a blogging platform or um, like Edmodo, which is a communication platform. Then, then it's a little bit different. Okay, my last thing is my pitch for global citizens. Oh my gosh, I think we are in such a place right now that we can support kids in being global citizens and make them understand the world better. And it's through understanding of differences that um, a lot of this unrest in the world, we're living in um, some turbulent times. And I really think as teachers, we have a lot of power in that. And we can get comfortable in it, and the kids can get comfortable in it. So I was at the Connected Educators thing in October and online. and. Um, one of the questions was, why is it important to be a connected educator? And I think you can only grow as big as your container. If your container is your team in your, in your school, that's as big as you can grow. You're just hashing around your same ideas. So grow your container bigger, and we have the entire world to, to grow into. So thank you very much. Is there any questions? You can raise your hand. and. Um, we click the little talk button. I also collected mm -hmm. questions too, Donna. Oh, um, great, and I was not watching the chat at all. That's where I got them from. Okay. Um, not sure if you already answered this, but and this goes to the, um, I think it was the Irish American project, I think. Um, but did they actually create a presentation with contributions from everyone in this group? Yes, they did. We did, um, we did a couple different things. We did voice thread. And our, my teacher in Ireland was brand new to everything. So mm -hmm. it was, it, the tech was a little bit stressful. So we did do a voice thread. And then they each did their own individual um, tech projects. And I don't know if that all got on there or not. but. Um, that was her first experience with it. OK. And also with that same question, um, this person also would love to do this with, Glo with Google presentations, but is having a hard time finding a partner school. Is there a way to streamline that process? Well, that's, that's like the magic question. I, I get that all the time. Really, the way to find it, um, great classrooms to work with online is to be a connected educator and be involved online and get involved in groups. The way I think is the quickest is if you join a project from the Global Classroom or um, Flat Connections or one of those organizations where you can actually work with and meet other teachers. There's not really any easy way to do that. There's a lot of places like just Skype in the classroom and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. just get involved and stay connected, and um, that's where you'll meet people. OK. With the reading across the globe, I think this went along, uh, what titles What book titles did you use? Um, I, I'm pretty sure they're on the wiki, and right now, okay. off the top of my head, I, right now what I'm using is um, My Librarian is a Camel. And it looks at different ways that kids get books around the world. And I don't know, if Tony, if you remember what our Book was it's I I'm not yeah, yeah, that's 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 sorry um, this past year we did out of my mind and we also did Marty McGuire um, I can't remember we're the talking whole about that reading across the globe remember that one with uh, the picture books oh we used a book called my family oh thank you okay 
Thanks, Tony. Uh, do you collaborate with the librarian in the school? Oh, that would be um, actually that's I, I collaborate a lot with our librarian. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're talking about that particular project, but yes, our librarian is also a, our media person. So, and I think Tony is um, you're the librarian and the media person at your in your building. So, seeing that more and more these days. That's great. Um, is there a good blog post on the 70% idea? Um, no, there actually isn't. I, I just, um, I don't even know. I might have just even made that up. That's kind of what I've been doing by just by rule of thumb. And I might have read that somewhere, but I can do a mm -hmm. little research on it. Someone also asked, is there a place to find out more about how to do EdCamp PD? Oh my gosh, there's so much out there on ed camps now. That is just all the rage, and um, there's been some great learning happening. So even if you just Google ed camp, I don't mm -hmm. know off the top of the, my head what the. Um, I think they have like a main site, and then they have a lot of separate ones. But I know they have just a, two or three of them even around my little area here. Mm -hmm. And and I know a lot of school districts are starting to do that within their district which is amazing. I think if you start 21st century learning in your district and then start using the wealth from within, it is very powerful. We always think to keep um, bringing people in from the outside and forget to look at what's going on in our buildings. Terrific. Uh, I see in the chat that Peggy asked Wes to get on mic. Is Wes still in the room? I'm not sure if Wes is still in the room. OK. I was trying to give Wes the mic tool so that he could get on mic if he wanted to. Looks like he's on his phone. Oh, there he is. OK, I found him. OK, Wes, you do have some lag, but yeah, he's got some lag. He now has okay. the microphone. Sorry. There we go. Go ahead, yeah. Wes. Sorry. So, sorry about that. Well, this was a wonderful presentation with so many great ideas. And thanks for the 70% idea. I think that is just a great one, and you know, starting with your Curriculum. Um, I was. I'm, I'm wondering what what have you found um, locally in your own building that has been most successful as you try to encourage other teachers, you know, to step out in this way and to get involved, especially with the collaborative projects. What what are the baby steps that, that you've seen be most successful to take first with the teachers that you are with in, in your school? Oh, that's a great question. Mom, the biggest tool that I need to use is patience. People, um, <laughs> people don't always just want to jump on. I forget that because I'm kind of like a jumping kind of person. And it took a lot, a lot, a lot of time for people to watch what I was doing, see if it's working, see if there's value. And I just kept offering and offering and offering. And finally, a couple people said, OK, let me try that. And, you know, it's it's some this a lot of this is brand new and I was so excited this year. This year we've had I think I have seven or eight fifth grade teachers that are working with me, which is amazing. And then some other um teachers around. But uh, once we all started using the same tool, like we all got on Kid Blog, then we could kind of work together in a district. If people were uncomfortable with it, they could work together just right now between us and start using in moto. And I think if you find ways, authentic ways, rather than teaching the tool and expecting people to figure it out, finding a way, like here's a project, here's a book in Global read -along has been great for that. Here's a book we're going to read. Let's all just take baby steps to learn how to use Edmodo. And that really has been successful. But it has not been um, quick by any means. Thanks so much. Those were the questions that I found in the chat, and I haven't seen any others. So I think we'll go ahead and 
go through the closing part of the show. And right now I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Donna. You have really set us on a path to thinking about ways we can get our schools more involved with global projects and global connecting and some fabulous resources to start that. So thanks so much. We do want to let all of you know that uh, we'll be off for the next two weeks. April 19th, we won't be having a show uh, for Easter weekend in the US. And we also won't be having a show on April 26th, because that's the Den Spring Virtual Conference. And lots of us like to go to that. It's totally free. So sign up and participate. You'll love it. On May 10th, we have a great show coming up where Donna Hatcher is going to share a, a really fabulous live binder that she has created about a bully project and memes that she has done with her students. And during that show, we're also going to have the co-creators of live binders, Tina and Barbara, join us to tell us about some of the newest features on Live Binders, which is always very exciting to hear about. And then on May 17th, we have Erin Maurer coming to join us as our featured teacher. So lots of great things to look forward to. I also want to let you know that there's a really good webinar coming up this week on Tuesday, April 22nd. Barbara Bray and Kathleen McClaskey have been doing a, an entire series of webinars on ways to personalize learning. And she has a great guest speaker this week. Elliot Washer is going to be talking about student engagement and personalization. So we invite you to join that webinar totally free uh, on Tuesday if you can. It will be recorded too, so you'll be able to view it later if the time doesn't work out for you. And another great opportunity, if you want to find people to connect with for any reason, the Learning Revolution Conference that Steve Harganan is hosting is coming up April 21st to the 25th. Interesting format this year. It's gonna, the first three days will be keynotes only. It will be one presentation each evening. Then the final two days of the conference are full day sessions by presenters from around the world and in many roles, not just schools, but libraries, museums, workplaces, non-traditional kinds of locations, homeschooled um, education. So be sure to check that out. And I'll drop the link in the chat as Lori finishes wrapping up. So, and it also is in our live binder. So you can check that out and participate. Again, it's all free. And don't forget about the Learning Revolution. You can get updates to all of these kinds of events by just signing up for their newsletter. And that's the learningrevolution.com. It's an amazing resource of opportunities ongoing, so be sure to check that out. And now I'm going to turn it back to Lori while I drop a few links in for you. Thank you, Peggy. To nominate a featured teacher, you can at this form, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the E at the very end. And you can nominate yourself as well to nominate a featured teacher for the month. When you exit the show, you should be directed to the survey for Classroom 2.0 Live. The survey link is also on this slide. Um, you can take the link from the chat box as well or from the Live Binder. There are three different places to get to the survey link about the show today. Once you take that link, you can request a professional development certificate that's at the bottom of the form. When you enter an email address for that, please make sure it's a personal email, one that you know works. Sometimes this gets blocked from school email addresses, and you won't get the certificate copy. Uh, that's tinyurl.com slash cr20livesurvey as well. 
The recordings also are available at iTunes U. There's a video collection and audio collection when iTunes U starts working better for Classroom 2.0 archives. There's also an RSS feed of the show archives that you can get from the Classroom 2.0 live site. Um, this has all of the um, links to the various recordings, whether it's the full Illuminate recording that somebody would, would watch from this show or just portions like the chat or like um, the audio. Special thanks again to our special guest, Donna Rahman, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming on a Saturday. In order for that recording to process, please remember that you must exit the classroom um, that way we can get the, the recordings on the various places. Again, thanks for coming.